Hello, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Talks with Chug. Each week, we cover pressing topics that matter to you and your business. My name is Ariana Gonzalez from Chug Attorneys and CPAs tuning in from our San Diego office. Please join me in welcoming attorney Jocelyn Juarez from our headquarters in Los Angeles, California. Hi there, Jocelyn, and welcome. Hello, Ariana, and hello, our audience uh, hearing us on the Chug Live today. I happy, like Ariana mentioned, Jocelyn Juarez Contreras, and based out of the LA office, I am one of the immigration attorneys. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Jocelyn. For today's topic, we will be covering parole in place for family members of military personnel. Just a quick disclaimer before we get started, this conversation is for informational purposes only. It does not create an attorney-client relationship. So if you have any questions, please comment them below or email us anytime at info at chug.com so we can help you out. Let's get right into it, Jocelyn. Can you tell us what is the legal basis for parole in place according to the Immigration and Nationality Act for family members of military personnel? Yes, I can, Ariana. So uh, PIP, we're going to be using this acronym probably throughout the conversation, is called parole in place. So that's what uh, uh, we're going to be using throughout the conversation. Uh, and it's basically, there are two policy manuals that USAIS issued in 2013 and 20, uh, 2016 uh, that kind of give them a little bit of guidance, but the actual regulation for uh, parole in place derives from the 212D 5A section of the Immigration Nationality Act. And, you know, the policy manual, uh, policy, sorry, memo gave a lot of good guidance to kind of determine what um, the emphasis was on this program, you know, allowing, you know, military personnel to have their family members have a way to a uh, pathway to residency without having, you know, the fear that their family member is going to be uh, facing deportation proceedings. Um, so that's kind of what the focus is. And it's a case by case decision making based on the policy guidance. Uh, and we'll be talking about it throughout our conversation. Mm, yeah, it is crucial to understand the INA's role here. So thank you for, for touching on that for us. So who is eligible for parole in place under this program out, as outlined by USCIS? Okay, yeah. So the uh, family members that could get um, this ability to do the program, uh, of course, the first thing is that the military personnel individual has to be a U.S. citizen and a legal permanent resident. So that's one of the things. But now who can apply based on then on this program is basically uh, spouses, uh, adult uh, children or children under 21, married or unmarried, and then uh, parents of the military personnel. Wow. Okay. Great to know. So what about the conditions um, that must be met for family members of military personnel to be eligible for PIP? What does that look like? Yeah, I could answer. I'm happy to. So PIP, basically, one of the biggest things of why PIP occurred is basically, um, just want to get a little bit of background before I go through the requirements, is that, you know, a lot of family members of military personnel, they might have not entered with a visa or inspection at the border uh, where they entered. So a lot of the times to be able to get a green card process done, even though the military personnel has a US citizenship or legal permanent residency, is that one of the requirements is that you were admitted and expected. Um, and so parole in place allows you to basically uh, go through the uh, ability to get a green card by having this parole in place, uh, which is one of the requirements of the admissions and parole. And the requirements that the either the spouse or the adult child or child under 21 or parent will need to show is that they uh, are currently residing in the U.S. Uh, they were not admitted or inspected, as I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, that they're related to the uh, military member. So, you know, uh, they're the parent, they're the spouse, uh, they're the child. So uh, the ways that you would usually normally prove that is, you know, if you're the spouse, you have a marriage certificate. If you're the child, you know, birth certificate, you're on the birth certificate. And or or if you're an adopted child, then that's a little bit different. But you can also uh, show that. And then also for the parent um, that you're on, they're on the birth certificate as well. Or if you're uh, adopted, that's a little bit different as well. And of course, that you don't have a criminal uh, record that could disqualify you. And then also, um, um, you know, it's kind of discretionary process. So there could be a little bit more requirements that are on a case by case basis. But kind of the couple ones that I talked at the beginning would be the normal requirements that we would need to prove. 
Okay, great to know. So it's good to know what conditions, you know, they they need to to qualify and be in for this. So if you, if you are watching this and have any questions about this and need clarification, please do reach out to us. We'd love to help you out. So are there specific forms or documentation required to apply for parole in place? Yeah, so there's a very specific form for the parole in place program. Um, USCIS, which is immigration, uh, their services that you would follow the application, Two is uh, the form is the I-131, sorry, I-131 form um, that you would submit to USCIS. Uh, and on that uh, form, you submit all the information that USCIS states. But of course, you also have to provide supporting evidence to the application. So of course, like I mentioned earlier, if you're applying for a parent, you know, uh, your birth certificate, uh, if you're um, in relation to that. If you're married, of course, the marriage certificate. Um, and then if you're a child that, you know, the, the person, uh, the military uh, member is on the birth certificate of the child. Um, now, the other kind of evidence that you would determine as well, it's, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm probably going to use it throughout the conversation, it's a very discretionary relief. So it's a case by case basis. Um, you would have to submit, you know, good kind of factors that could um, prove why you should get the parole in place approved. So of course, if you have very good contacts with the community, you know, you've been here and you have a no criminal record and how the hardship would be to your military uh, family member if you were to not get this program basically. Um, so it's basically a lot of uh, drafting of uh, letters on, you know, to, to kind of prove uh, the hardship to your family and also why you're not any kind of um, nothing should really prevent you from getting the, the, the ability to get approved for this program as well. Um, aside from that as well, also the very important one, as we're mentioning, uh, the military member has to then prove, of course, that they're part of the military. So it could be either that they're an uh, active duty uh, U.S. Armed Forces member, or they have been part of the uh, selected reserve uh, ready, uh, reserve ready, or that they're a veteran, veteran and they previously were part of the Armed Forces or uh, of the selected reserve, uh, reserve ready basically as well. So um, that's one of the things, usually is documentation from military. So it's a very specific form or military identification. Um, and then of course, identification that they're a US citizen or a legal permanent residency uh, uh, as well. Okay, got it. Yes, documentation is is always really important. So thank you for clarifying what's needed in this case. Um, I do want to touch on how the the um, parole in place um, is supported, how it supports military families according to USCIS policy. Yeah, so I know I've briefly touched upon it, but I mean, the main kind of guidance that came when this program kind of starting to be implemented, you know, a lot of uh, military personnel, they're sometimes abroad overseas and, you know, their family are, remain here in the U.S. And part of this is, you know, having them be, do all this, you know, work on the behalf of us that enjoy our life, you know, on a day to day basis without having to worry about a lot of things is that we want to make sure that, you know, the military personnel's uh, members feel supported by the U.S. as well. And that means that for their family, you do not have to, uh, when they're outside the U.S., not have to fear that their family is going to face any U.S. certainty with uh, immigration, that they're not going to be deported, they're not going to be in proceedings. So that's a lot of, of the way that the guidance came out for this program. So it's a very important program um, because it, you know, it puts a, a an easier way to get a pathway to residency, basically. Um, because a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of family members might have not entered with a visa or, or admission. So this is a very good uh, program to look at for um, family members of military personnel. So that might be in this situation. Absolutely. Supporting military families is crucial and USCIS really highlights that. So um, I do want to touch on how can PIP benefit family members of military personnel in terms of U.S. immigration options? Yeah, that's that's a very important uh, point that we want to make sure our audience is kind of understanding. So basically, like I mentioned, we mentioned the requirements and who's able to apply. Once you submit and if you're approved, you will get basically uh, the approval saying, you know, you're for PIP. And with that approval, you're able actually to apply for an employment authorization card. And you're also able to apply for a social security number. Um, and so that and that would be valid probably not probably sorry. It will be valid for one year. Um, but it also allows you, of course, if you haven't filed an I-130 application, which is the application if you're related to a U.S. citizen 
or a legal permanent resident to start your pathway to legal, um, to obtaining green card, basically a lawful permanent resident for yourself. Um, but really that the two quick, um, easiest or quickest benefits, it's the uh, employment authorization card and the social security number at the, um, and you would approve that, uh, you would file for that as soon as you're approved for PIP. Got it. Yes, those immigration benefits can definitely make a big difference for families. So I'm glad we touched on that. Um, can you talk about what protection um, the parole in place offers against deportation? Yeah, so like I mentioned, the PAP uh, allows for protection basically because you're paroled in for the time that the validity is valid, you know, from uh, deportation for the most part, you know, as soon as you file, of course, the I-130 application, you have a pending, you know, green card. And then the biggest thing, as I mentioned just briefly, is the employment authorization, right? Uh, being able to work with, you know, much more relief of not, you know, being, um, you know, hold out that you can't work because you don't have authorization is a biggest, a big benefit. Um, you will also also get a um, I-94, which is what you would submit for your I-130 application, which is basically that you have parole status. Um, so it's a it's a big protection. And, um, you know, as soon as you get it, usually the recommendation is if possible, file for the I-130, I-130 to get uh, the legal permanent residency process uh, submitted. Wow. Okay. Great to know that there, there is um, protection from defor deportation. Um, I do want to ask you what options are available for individuals with final orders of removal who wish to remain in the United States? What options are we looking at? <laughs> So I'm going to say, first of all, the uh, deportation orders, we would have to kind of discuss that with that potential client. It's a very different for each case. We don't know if it's just one or two deportation or what the situation is, but there is a possibility. I know for each administration, you know, how uh, we're able to kind of connect to what the uh, position is. But on some occasions, there is a possibility that um, an attorney such as myself can reach out to the attorney for the government it, with uh, with the immigration court, uh, which is the UIR, and see if they're willing to motion to reopen uh, the order and see if they're willing to terminate the case, uh, basically to uh, allow the person to apply for PAP. But again, it's a case by case, we would have to discuss, but there may be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. So how do USCIS officers assess the merit of a parole in place application? Do we have any information on that? Yeah, so I think this connects back to kind of the point that I made at the beginning. So uh, USAS has, of course, their policy manual, their pi policy guidance uh, memorandums, and all the time the adjudication comes based on that. Um, like I mentioned, and I mentioned it earlier, it's very discretionary, but there is a little bit of, you know, favorable discretion um, kind of uh, mentions on the policy guidance, you know, make sure that, you know, everything is kind of being reviewed in full. Um, you know, that uh, everything, every piece of evidence is giving, uh, you know, a fair weight to the determination of a possible positive uh, determination. Um, but it really derives really for the for the policy manual. Of course, the biggest kind of uh, pointer that we would mention, the more evidence that's submitted, um, you know, the, the best, the better chance for the case to be approvable. Good to know. Thank you for explaining that. So can parole in place be granted if the military personnel are stationed overseas? How does that work? Yeah, so the, the good thing is it, it, the effect is not really on the military member being abroad, is that the family member who's going to get this program is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's a must. You can't really be uh, outside can't, uh, situation. But if the uh, if the military member is, you know, stationed, that's probably a lot of uh, military personnel is stationed abroad or elsewhere. Right. Um, there's no problem. They could, you know, could they could do the process. Their family member would apply for the I-131 application, uh, submit. And then really the only thing you would need is a copy of the identification from the military member um, so that they could be submitted for the application for per own place. Fantastic. Okay, great to know that that's not an issue. Um, what are the requirements for deferred app for for deferred action if the applicant is the spouse or child of a U.S. military member or veteran? 
Yeah, so deferred action is, um, it's usually um, always viewed by an attorney in addition to parole in place because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, parole in place, um, one of the requirements is that you were not admitted or inspected. So that means you didn't come in uh, into the U.S. with a visa or, um, or any kind of permission to come in. Um, and if you have and you don't have status and then you're, you're either a spouse or, or a child of a military member, um, then you really can't uh, do parole in place, but you could potentially do deferred action. Uh, deferred action is kind of a protection as well as parole in place for um, like deportation, um, but it, it's, it's a little bit of more of a protection. And of course, if you were admitted, you we normally talk about this. And then also deferred action may be a possibility if you are uh, might not be related to an act, uh, active duty member of the armed forces. Maybe there's certain uh, divisions that are not applicable for poor in place. So it's another really uh, deferred action is a potential option for some of the people that may not qualify per in, for poor in place. Mm, okay, understood. Can you share what the difference is between the benefits of PIP and deferred action are? Yeah, so for, for PIP, like I mentioned, you know, once you get it approved, if you don't have an admission or uh, or, or been inspected, then you could do the I-130 process. Deferred action doesn't have the same pathway that pro in place will, but, um, you know, the biggest thing is the protection from deportation is still available for both, which is, you know, a really big uh, positive uh, that thing that you usually would, you would talk about with a potential client um, because, you know, a lot of the time, you know, that's what they're, kind of looking for, um, mm -hmm. to not have to be, you know, in limbo or uncertain about what their situation is in the U.S. But, um, but reality, if there's, if they're able to apply for either program, that would be a good consideration to discuss with, you know, with us, um, to look into it. Okay. Really good to know. Thanks for sharing that with us. Can an individual with a pending I-130 or I-360 petition still apply for parole in place? How how does that work? He, this question is very interesting because it, I would say, and it's probably what a lot of our audience may heard from other attorneys, it depends. Uh, it depends where you're at. Why I'm saying this is because for I-130, 360, um, especially for 360, there's a lot of um, abilities to get the, the process started without having been uh, admitted or inspected. So really the biggest thing is the first question I would ask is, have you been admitted or expected? Um, because if you have, then we are not talking about PIP. But if, um, sorry, if, if they haven't been admitted or expected, um, they, we will talk about it. But if they have, then of course we can't really look at PIP. Um, and then, but if they um have not and they have not then we would look at PAP and then potentially you could still do PAP even though you have an I-130 pending and a 360. Uh, they're different processes so it really would depends to kind of figure out what the situation is for that person but uh, it may be possible. Okay that's good to consider. If you do have additional questions about this and you're watching it please reach out to us at info at chug.com. We can connect you with Jocelyn and you know we'd love to help you out. So um, what are some common reasons for a parole in place denial and how can these be addressed in a reapplication? Yeah, so denials, uh, I think it would depend what the denial is for. Um, since, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the things is this relief is really discretionary. So the more evidence that's submitted, the better um, for the case, uh, because there's really not a, you know, a guideline that says this is all you need to submit for approvability, right? So the best thing is to make sure you submit as much evidence. You know, if you've been here, you prove that you've been here for since the date that you mentioned. Um, and also um, the biggest thing is if you don't know your full immigration history, um, the requirement would be to make sure you have a, 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 a very clear sense of your full immigration history. And this usually could be done through a, a FOIA uh, request, which is the Freedom of Information Act, to see what um, what there is on file for you. So were you actually admitted or inspected? Because if you have, you, you can't really do a PAP. -A -P. Um, but if you haven't, then you want to make sure you have all the information ready for that. Um, also, um, any criminal record, you want to make sure you look at that very closely. Um, some things are not really cured by uh, applying for PAP, um, so you want to make sure that you know very clearly on this. Um, you want you want to make sure you have a full sense of what your what your background is, what you have, to make sure you have the best chance to get uh, PAP approved and not receive a denial. So 
yeah, that would that would be what I would discuss. Absolutely. Denials can be pretty tough. Um, how should applicants address any prior immigration violations in their parole in place application? Yeah, so that's an interesting question to kind of discuss because I think a lot of the time when we're discussing PIP, um, we're always kind of hearing about, um, this is a very technical term, but one of the things that PIP does not cure is a permanent bar. Um, and so you can't really do PIP if you have a permanent bar. And this is the situation where, you know, you um, you were here, you were issued an order, and then you're not allowed to return, and you do, that. that's a situation of you can't really cure that with PIP. You're not going to be able to get PIP. So it depends what, how the violation, what the violation is exactly and see how, um, you know, we could kind of distinguish it uh, as well. So it really would depend what the violation uh, kind of aggravating, how aggravating it is and how um, how to see how we would approach it for PIP. Absolutely. Addressing prior violations is crucial. So thank you for that insight. Um, how does the expiration of a parole in place grant affect the applicant's status and options for renewal? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, PIP is only valid for a year. So usually the the recommendation is always to make sure to you know apply as soon as you can to start your process because you're only valid for for a year, right? Uh, start the process to get the a legal permanent residency, you know, started. Um, but there is a possibility that you can renew uh, the PAP. Um, now, if you have either I one I one thirty or three sixty pending, it's a little bit different. Um, for the I-130, uh, for the most part, they ask for a, a confirmation that's already been filed. Uh, for the 360, it's a little bit different, but it's kind of a situation where you want to make sure you at least get the process started. So if you do need to renew, you have proof that's already been, that it's pending. You know, sometimes processing times take longer, so you might still be pending by the time that you need to renew. So, um, but it, there is a possibility that um, you can renew if, if needed. Okay, really good to know. I do want to touch on ICE a little bit. What are the potential legal and procedural challenges when ICE is involved in parole in place cases for military family members in removal proceedings? So the good thing is if your case is still pending with uh, Immigration Court, which is the EOIR um, agency, um, there is the possibility um, to be able to reach out to the ICE attorney to see um to see if they're willing to terminate the case uh which basically means that the case will be gone from from immigration court and for them to either if you're able to apply with uh immigration court directly for PIP it is a possibility or if they're willing for you to you just go directly to USCIS to uh, apply for PIP um so that's kind of if you are in that situation that would be a conversation to have so that you could potentially um, not have to continue with, you know, immigration proceedings and and do relief that is much more possible with uh, um, immigration services, which is USCIS. Got it. Great to know. ICE involvement can can certainly complicate things. So I'm glad we're covering this. How does the renewal process for PIP differ for surviving spouses, parents, sons and daughters of deceased service members compared to other applicants? Yeah, so it, I think it was, uh, I mentioned earlier briefly regarding the I-130 and 360, so it would depend when uh, applications are filed for the I-130 for like spouses, if you need to renew, they just need a copy of the, um, the pending I-130. For 360, you have to just make sure when the um, application was submitted, um, and then for the most part, they also ask for the pending confirmation as well, um, so it, it would just kind of depend that you want to make sure that everything has been felt uh, correctly so that you have confirmation for the renewal process for the PIP. Got it. Great to know. Thanks for sharing that with us. So what unique challenges do family members face when seeking parole in place for undocumented relatives and how can they navigate these challenges effectively? Yeah, that's a very uh, common question that we get, you know, how do how do we approach PIP? Mm -hmm. Biggest thing is probably that uh, when I talk to potential clients is a lot of them, you know, they've been here for a long time, so they might not have access to a lot of the documentation that's necessary. So you want to make sure if you're thinking of proceeding with this process that you start collecting all the documentation necessary. So, uh, you know, birth certificate, uh, marriage certificate, everything that regards to, you know, biographical information that you have access to. 
Also that you um, make sure that um, you have as, of course, as much of the evidence necessary, as I mentioned, this is discretionary. So, um, you know, good recommendation, you know, if you're positive, uh, background, no criminal is issues. Also, you know, one of the kind of points that we made earlier is this, this process, the military member can be abroad. So sometimes getting access to some of the information you need from them might be a little bit hard. So communicating as well, like, you know, what nece what's necessary. Um, it, the process takes a while to build, you know, to prepare the case. So also being in tune that the process does take a while as well. So, you know, making sure we connect uh, very directly with our potential clients to kind of let them know the processing is, whatever it is, whether we need. And we really do guide them across the whole process to make sure that we make it as um, easy as possible. And then we have them uh, have the best chance possible to get the uh, probability. Absolutely. Navigating these challenges can be tough, but we're here to support and, and help in every way we can. So we are close on time, but I do want to ask you one more question, Jocelyn. I appreciate your time and, and insights with us, but what are the practices for, what are the best practices for legal advocates to follow when representing military families seeking parole in place amid changing immigration policies? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing when you're working with a potential client when it comes to her own place is making sure to kind of let them understand that this relief, um, especially for military members, uh, family members, is that, of course, it's a good kind of uh, ability to apply. Uh, it should really be looked at it closely to a potential uh, ability to apply because it allows people to really do the uh, uh, the green card process for the family members without having you know to step out to the U.S. So discussing how the process would be different if they were to not apply for PAP versus if they were to apply for PAP, it's a it's very different uh, processing time wise. You know, not having to be separated, uh, having to do concert interviews abroad versus not. And then, of course, uh, making sure that you're in tune to what the um, current administration uh, for the government is uh, looking at in regards to PAP. Um, I know we, right now we're talking about military personnel for family members, but currently there was a program for U.S. citizens, uh, spouse, uh, non-citizen spouses and, and stepchildren. So sometimes there are new programs that are coming out. So it's, you want to make sure you, you're following what the requirements are for the specific program. Um, but it, it's really about working closely with the potential client to make sure that the navigation of this process is as smooth as possible, because it's really about uh, the evidence that being presented in the best way to kind of make sure that you're providing everything to what USAS will be looking for. Absolutely great advice. And I do want to briefly mention, we do have a blog on our website where we do post regular immigration updates. So if you do want to sign up for that, go ahead to, to chug.com, C-H-U-G-H.com and check out our blog posts. You can sign up for notifications and we'll definitely let you know when there are important updates on this. So that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for your time, your insights and, and sharing all of this wonderful information with us. This brings us to the end of our conversation. Thank you everyone for tuning in. In. To stay up to date, please subscribe and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If you have any questions or suggestions, email us at info at chook.com anytime. Let us know what topic you want to see next. And make sure to join us back here next week for more pressing topics that truly matter to you and your business. Until next time, stay safe and take care, everyone. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.